Well, on our calendar here in the West, it's October 16th, 2010. And on the Hebrew calendar, the 8th of Cheshvan, 5771. And I've entitled the message, Starting But Not Finishing. And I want to start there in the Parsha, um, where we were at Lech Lecha, Bereshit, chapter 12, verse 1. Um, the story, obviously, as we were talking earlier, but for the sake of the video, Parsha today covers the beginning story of Avraham. But we first encounter Avram, <coughs> his former self, at the end of last week's Parsha. And if you go there um, to chapter 11, verses 31 and 32, we have some verses here that say, Terach took his son Avram, his son Haran's son Lot, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Avram's wife, and they left Ur of the Chasdim to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they stayed there. Now, sometimes I've wondered, did they name the place where they stayed Haran after his son, or did he name his son after the place? Doesn't tell us that, but anyway. They stayed there. Terach lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The question that we have to ask, considering the fact that in the, in the next, the following verses, we read about an encounter with God of, between Avram and God, where God says, basically, he doesn't tell him where he's going to go, but the destination is Canaan. You have to ask the question, so then why did Terach leave Ur of the Kasdim to go to Canaan? The text doesn't tell us, but there is a lot of speculation amongst the rabbis, and some of that speculation, I think, is potentially true. And that is, could it have been that Terach received the call first from God to go to Canaan? I think that possibly he did. And I think <clears throat> that it's not only conceivable but probable. And I think that the reason the story reads the way that it does is only because Terach didn't finish what he started. And it says he stopped. And I think he took second best. And I, I think, you know, there are some, there, there are some linguistic indicators here for this theory. Number one, if you read the listing, um, the generations, as the scripture likes to call them, if you read the generations, here's how most of them read. Our Pakshad lived 35 years and fathered Shelach. After Shelach was born, our Pakshad 
lived another 403 years and had sons and daughters. Shalach lived 30 years and fathered Ever. After Ever was born, Shalach lived another 403 years and had sons and daughters. You see how they're all ending. Ever lived 34 years and fathered Peleg. After Peleg was born, Ever lived another 430 years and had sons and daughters. Even when we get up here to where it's talking about Nahor, who was the father of Terach, Nahor lived 29 years and fathered Terach. After Terach was born, Nahor lived another 119 years and had sons and daughters. But when it gets to the description of Terach, it says after Terach had given birth to Avram, Nahor, and Haran, that he lived 205 years. It doesn't say, and he had sons and daughters. It makes a point of saying, and he died in Haran. There is... There is an emphasis being placed on the location where he died because it's significant. Okay? In other words, he was not supposed to die in Haran. He was supposed to die in Canaan. And so, because he stopped this trek from where he was, was to Canaan, then that's basically where his story ends. And because he didn't go on to Canaan, then the story picks up with his son, Avram. And it's through Avram that the promise actually ends up coming. Now, obviously, it ultimately would have still gone that direction because Avram is Terach's son. And it would have been Terach and Avram and Yitzchak and Yaakov. But this story could have read differently. It could have been the story of Terach having the encounter with God and believing God and following through with what God told him to do instead of Avram. <clears throat> and I think that because, because Terak stopped in Haran and didn't go on to Canaan, then we have, here's some more linguistic evidence for this theory, is found in chapter 12 verse 1 where Adonai speaks to Avram, and he makes a pointed statement to him. Get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, and away from your father's house. Okay, he could have just said, Okay, Avram, pack your stuff and go. But there is a, there is a pointed statement being made here. Get away from your father's house. Why? Well, one thing was Terach was an idol maker. Okay? So Terach was, for all intents and purposes, a pagan. But so was Avram when they started off. Okay? And so there was this potential in Terach, even though he was an idol maker, that had he turned his attention to the one true God and turned away from all of the idols and done what God had told him to do in going to Canaan, it could have been the story of Terach instead of Avram. Avram obeyed. And God was saying, I want you to make a break. I want you to make a break and a separation between you and your family because your family, your father's house, your father didn't follow through with what was asked of him 
I want you to separate yourself from that and I want you to be a different person. I want you to fulfill what, what's being asked of your family. And, you know, in chapter 15, verse 6, it says about Avraham, he believed in Adonai and he credited it to him as righteousness. I believe this statement could have been made about Terach if Terach had followed through and finished. But Avram did not quit. We find out that um, this whole encounter uh, in chapter 12 verse 4 this encounter with God when he's still Avram and he takes off for Canaan it tells us that he was 75 years old when he left Haran okay if we go over to chapter 17, we see that it says, When Avram was 99 years old, Adonai appeared to Avram. So, within just a few words and a couple pages, 25 years have passed. And Avram is still holding on to that initial account, uh, encounter that he had had with God. Still believing, still waiting to see what was supposed to happen, and still believing. It's just, you know, that's the reason why chapter 15 says what, it, verse 6 says what it does about him. Now I want to I want to compare that though to his nephew's behavior. And next week's parsha like we talked about deals with the destruction of Sodom and Amorah. And we see that when the angels first tell Lot in um, Chapter 19, uh, verse 14, it tells us that when the angels gave him the message, his initial response was that he became basically became a preacher for the angels. It says, Lot went out and spoke with his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up and leave this place because Adonai is going to destroy this city. But of course we know his sons-in-law, it says, didn't take him seriously. Okay? Now that was his initial response. So he was very he believed what the angels were telling him. He rushed to his sons-in-law and said, "You got to you got to get out of here because God's going to destroy this area." But we see in verse 16 what happened to him the next day. It says, "But he dallied." So the men or the angels took hold of his hands his wife's hand in the hands of his two daughters. Adonai was being very merciful to him and led them, leaving them outside the city. When they had brought them out, he said, Flee for your life. Don't look behind you and don't stop anywhere in the plain, but escape to the hills. Otherwise you will be swept away. 
And then Lot argues with them. So not only does he dally about getting out, but he argues with what they told him to do. And he says in verse 18, Please know, my Lord, here your servant has already found favor in your sight, and you have shown me even greater mercy by saving my life. But I can't escape to the hills, because I'm afraid the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now wait a minute. Who was it that was saying it'd be a good thing for you to go to the hills? It wasn't just some human being that was coming up with a good idea. This is a message from God. Go to the hills and you'll be safe. Look, there's a town nearby to flee to and it's a small one. Please let me escape there. Isn't it just a small one? And that way I will stay alive. He replied, all right, I agree to what you've asked. I won't overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry and escape to that place because I can't do anything until you arrive there. For this reason, the city was named Sogar, which means small. Uh, by the time Lot had come to Zohar, the sun had risen over the land and of course God brings the judgment. Now, let me show you something else. Uh, let's go down to verse uh, 30. So the whole reason he's saying, I don't want to go up into the hills because I'm afraid. Okay. Lot went up from Zoar and lived in the hills. The very place that God had said, that's where you need to go. And he said, no, 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 I'm afraid. He goes and lives in the hills with his two daughters. Why? Because he was afraid to stay in Zoar, the place he asked to go to. This, this is the kind of I'm showing you this in contrast to Avram, Avraham, because this is the way not to do it. Okay? <clears throat> and he didn't end up in the hills because God told him to go to the hills. He ended up in the hills because he was afraid. Okay? So he was afraid to go to the hills to begin with, so he goes to this town. And then he's afraid to live in the town, so he goes to the hills. So everything that he's doing is because he's afraid. Very different reaction, very different responses and choices. And then I also want to take a look at uh, Shaul Melech, King, King Saul. And... Where I want us to go is Shmuel Aleph, 1 Samuel. Chapter 9. To begin with, we're going to read chapters 9 and 10 to give you a, a, an idea of what Shaul was like in the beginning. And then we're going to look at how he finished. There was a man from Binyamin named Kish, the son of Aviel, the son of Zagor, the son of Bechorat, the son of Afiach, the son of a man from Binyamin. He was a man of substance and brave as well. He had a son named Shaul, who was young and good looking. Among the people of Israel, there was no one better looking than he. He stood head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. Once the donkeys belonging to Kish, Shaul's father, got lost. Kish said to his son Shaul, 
Please take one of the servants with you. Go out and look for the donkeys. He went through the hills of Ephraim and the territory of Shalisha, but they didn't find them. Then they went through the territory of Sha'alim, but they weren't there. They went through the territory of Benjamin, but didn't find them there either. On reaching the territory of Tsuf, Shaul said to his servant with him, Come, let's go back. Otherwise my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and stop, start worrying about us. His servant replied, Here now. There's a man of God in this city, a man who is highly respected, and everything he says proves true. Let's go to him. Maybe he can tell us something about where we should go. But look, Shaul said to his servant, if we go to the man, what can we bring him? We've used up all the bread in our packs, and there's nothing for us to give the man of God. What do you, what do you have left? The servant replied again to Shaul, See, I, I have here in my hand a silver quarter shekel, or one-tenth of an ounce. I will give it to the man of God to tell us which way to go. So they're just going to uh, try to figure out where the donkeys went. In Israel, back in the old days, when someone went to consult God, he would say, Come, let's go to the seer. Because a person now called a prophet used to be called a seer. Well said, Shaul answered his servant. Come, come on, let's go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Ascending the slope to the town, they found girls going out to draw water and asked them, Is the seer here? The girls answered them, He's here. He's right ahead of you. Hurry now. He just came into the city today because the people are sacrificing today at the high place. Find him as soon as you enter the city before he goes up to the high place to eat because the people won't eat until he comes and blesses the sacrifice. Afterwards, the ones invited will eat. So go on up because this is when you'll find him. They went up to the city and as they entered the city, there was Shmuel coming out toward them to go on up to the high place. The day before Shaul arrived, Adonai had given Shmuel a revelation. Quote, Tomorrow at about this time I will send you a man from the territory of Benjamin. You are to anoint him prince over my people Yisrael. He will save my people from the power of the Pelishtim, because I have seen my people's situation and their cry of distress, distress has come to me. End quote. When Shmuel saw Shaul, Adonai said to him, Here is the man I told you about, the one who is going to govern my people. Shaul approached Shmuel in the gateway and said, Please, tell me where the seer's house is. Shmuel, Shmuel answered Shaul, I'm the seer. Go up ahead of me to the high place because you're going to dine with me today. In the morning I will let you leave and I will tell you everything that is on your heart. As for your donkeys that got lost three days ago, don't worry about them. They've been found. Now who is it that all Israel wants? Isn't it you and all your father's household? Shaul replied, I'm only a man from Benjamin the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families in the tribe of Benjamin. Why are you saying such a thing to me? Shmuel took Shaul and his servant, brought them into the room, and had them sit in the place reserved for the most important of the invited guests, who numbered about 30 persons. Shmuel instructed the cook, serve the portion I gave you and told you to set aside. The cook took the thigh and the adjoining meat and served it to Shaul. Shmuel said, Here, this is what remains. Put it in front of you and eat. It was kept especially for you until the right time, because I said I have invited the people. So Shaul dined with Shmuel that day. On coming down from the high place to the city, he spoke with Shaul on the roof. They got up early, about daybreak, 
Shmuel called out to Shaul on the roof, Get up so I can send you on your way. Shaul got up and both of them, um, uh, he and Shmuel, went out. As they were going down at the edge of the city, Shmuel said to Shaul, Tell the servant to go on ahead. So the servant went on. But you stand still now because I want, to, I want you to hear what God has said. Then Shmuel took a flask of oil he had prepared and poured it on Shaul's head. He kissed him and said, Adonai has anointed you to be prince over his inheritance. After you leave me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Seltzah. They will tell you that the donkeys you are searching for have been found and that your father has stopped thinking about the donkeys and is anxious over you and asking, what am I to do about my son? Go on from there and you will come to the oak of Tavor. Three men will meet you there on their way up to God at Beit El. One of them will be carrying three kids, another three loaves of bread, and the third a skin of wine. They will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you are to accept from them. Very specific. After that, you will come to Giva of God, where the Pelish team are garrisoned. On arrival at the city there, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place, preceded by lutes, tambourines, flutes, and lyres, and they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of Adonai will fall on you. You will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. When these signs come over you, just do whatever you feel like doing because God is with you. Then you're to go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and there I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and present sacrifices as peace offerings. Wait there seven days until I come to you and tell you what to do. As it happened, <clears throat> as soon as he turned his back to leave Shmuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs took place that day. When they arrived at the hill, and there in front of him was a group of prophets, the Spirit of God fell on him, and he prophesied along with them. When those who knew him from before saw him there prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What's happened to Kish's son? Is Shaul a prophet too? Someone in the crowd answered, Must prophets' fathers be special? So it became an expression, Is Shaul a prophet too? When, when he had finished prophesying, he arrived at the high place. Shaul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where did you go? He answered, To look for the donkeys. When we saw that they hadn't been found, we went to Shmuel. Tell me, please, said Shaul's uncle, what, did Shmuel, what Shmuel said to you. Shaul answered his uncle. He told us that the donkeys had been found, but said nothing to him about the matter of his being made king. Shmuel summoned the people to Adonai in Mitzpah. He said to the people of Israel, Here is what Adonai, the God of Israel, says, I brought Israel up from Egypt. I rescued you from the power of the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But today you have rejected your God who himself saves you from all your disasters and distress. You have said to him, No, put a king over us. So now present yourselves before Adonai by your tribes and families. So Shmuel had all the tribes come forward and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. More, more than likely by lot. He had the tribe of Benjamin come forward by families, and the family of the Matri was chosen, and Shaul, the son of Kish, was chosen. Now listen to this. But when they looked for him, he couldn't be found. They asked Adonai, has the man come here? Adonai answered, so they had to ask God, where is this guy? <clears throat> Adonai answered, there he is, hiding in among the equipment. They ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was head and shoulders taller than anyone around. Shmuel said to all the people, Do you see the man Adonai has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? 
Then all the people shouted, Long live the king! Shmuel told the people what kinds of rulings should be made in the kingdom, then wrote it on a scroll and set it down before Adonai. After that he sent all the people away, every one to his own home. Shaul too went home to Giva, accompanied by warriors whose hearts God had touched. True, there were some scoundrels who said, How can this man save us? They showed him no respect and brought him no gift, but he held his peace. This is how he started. God pouring out his spirit on him, changing his heart, making him into a different person. He was a shy kind of guy that wanted to hide from everybody. And they had to basically drag him out to even do the ceremony of making him king. And yet it's not very long before he changes. And all of this goes to his head. And in chapter 15, verses 1 through 23... Shmuel said to Shaul, Adonai sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now listen to what Adonai has to say. Here is what Adonai Tzva'ot says. I remember what Amalek did to Yisrael, how they fought against Yisrael when they were coming up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Don't spare them. But kill men and women, children and babies, cows and sheep, camels and donkeys. Shaul summoned the people and reviewed them in Telaim. 200,000 foot soldiers with another 10,000 men from Yehuda. Shaul arrived at the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Shaul said to the Keni, Go away, withdraw, leave your homes there with the Amalekhi. Otherwise, I might destroy you along with them. Even though you were kind to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kani went away from among the Amaleki. Then Shaul attacked Amalek, starting at Havilah and continuing toward Shur at the border of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of Amalek, alive. But he completely destroyed the people, putting them to the sword. However, Shaul and the people spared Agag, along with the best of the sheep and cattle, and even the second best, also the lambs and everything that was good. They weren't inclined to destroy these things. But everything that was worthless or weak, they completely destroyed. Then the word of Adonai came to Shmuel. I regret setting up Shaul as king because he has turned back from following me and hasn't obeyed my orders. This made Shmuel very sad so that he cried to Adonai all night. Shmuel got up early in the morning to meet Shaul. However, Shmuel was told, Shaul came to Carmel to set up a monument for himself there. But now he has left and is on his way down to Gilgal. Shmuel went to Shaul. Shaul said to him, May Adonai bless you. I have done what Adonai ordered. But Shmuel answered, If so, why do I hear sheep bleeding and cows mooing? Shaul said, They brought them, they brought them from the Amalekhi, because the people spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to Adonai your God. Yeah, right. But we completely destroyed the rest. Then Shmuel said to Shaul, Stop. I'm going to tell you what Adonai said to me last night. And Shaul said, Speak. Shmuel then said, 
You may be small in your own sight, but you are head of the tribes of Israel. Adonai anointed you king over Israel. Now Adonai sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy Amalek, those sinners. Keep making war on them until they have been exterminated. Why did you seize the spoil instead of paying attention to what Adonai said? From Adonai's viewpoint, you have done an evil thing. Shaul said to Shmuel, I did too pay attention to what Adonai said, and I carried out the mission on which Adonai sent me. I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and I completely destroyed Amalek, but the people took some of the spoil, the best of the sheep and cattle set aside for destruction, to sacrifice to Adonai your God in Gilgal. Shmuel said, does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice. In heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Adonai, he too has rejected you as king. Do you see a pattern here in Lot, Lot, and Shaul? You know, their initial encounters, they say yes to God. But then at some point in time, they end up insisting on doing things their own way. And as a result, things go very badly for them. I didn't finish the story with Lot, what ended up happening with him. But this, that story goes on to talk about his two daughters getting him drunk in t on two different occasions, having sex with him, and from that, that, those two unions came two people groups with whom Israel had to fight constantly. They were a thorn in Israel's side. Okay? And in this case, we know the story of Shaul. Obviously, we don't have time to, to read all of this and what happens with David. You know, when David comes along and God says, you're going to take Shaul's place. And um, David just keeps pursuing God and pursuing God's timing on doing everything. He won't do anything until God tells him to. And Shaul's spending all of his time trying to kill David. And we know that Shaul is tormented with demons. Now, I don't want to leave us with that negative picture. But that is, that's what happens when we start with God but we don't finish with God. When we say yes in the beginning and then once we get on down the road we start doing things our own way and not asking Him for His input, for His guidance in our lives. But here's, here's the, some examples or an example that I want to give to you. Examples of finishers. The best list of example, uh, examples of finishers is obviously a passage that we used last Shabbat in the message from Ivrim, Hebrews chapter 11. That whole list of people that are commended in Hebrews 11, those were all finishers. 
Those were all people who started with God and finished with God. And that's the reason why they were successful. That's the reason why they were lauded by God. And then we have the messages in the book of the Revelation to the various congregations, to the seven congregations. And all of those finish with promises made to those who overcome specifically. Those who finish with God get the rewards. Those who do not, do not get the rewards. And in fact, in some of the instances, he threatens pun severe punishment if they don't comply with his wishes. Okay? The, the main example I want to finish with is Yaakov, Jacob. <coughs> now he got a rough start when he began his start was with lying, cheating, and usurping. So all of these people, you know, they start off as basically nothings. And then they have an encounter with God. And it's God who makes them a something. And starts them down the road. <clears throat> And Yaakov became mature through the situation where he had to flee from Esav, his brother who wanted to kill him, and go live with his uncle Lavan. And through that 21 years that he's there with Lavan, God works maturity into him. So that by the time that he is ready to leave Levon, he's actually a very different individual than he was when he got there. And of course, years can do that for us. But I want us to look at something. Something that is easy to miss. <coughs> In Bereshit, Genesis Chapter 33. <clears throat> and we're not too many weeks away from actually dealing with this uh, parsha. <clears throat> Bereshit chapter 33 verses 16 and 17. This is after Yaakov's encounter with God, the wrestling match. This is after his encounter with his brother. And now he and his brother are, are, are parting ways. And Asav says, I'm living in Seir. Come on up and, and live with me in Seir. There's plenty of room. We can both be there. And uh, Yaakov can't help but Put that last little lie in there. He says, sure, brother, I'll, I'll be there. Of course, he never, he never shows up. Instead, it says in verses 16 and 17 of 33, So, Esav left that day to return to Seir. Yaakov went on to Sukkot where he built himself a house and put up shelters for his cattle. This is why the place is called Sukkot or shelters. Now why is this significant? This is significant because potentially at this moment in time this is a Haran situation for Yaakov. Where Terach ended up on his way to Canaan, but stopping in Haran and settling there and living there and dying there and not going on to Canaan. Yaakov stops in Sukkot. 
and builds himself a house and basically a compound. Okay? And Yaakov's story was in jeopardy at this moment in time. Because this was not where God was leading him. This wasn't his destiny. His destiny wasn't Sukkot, which by the way, <coughs> Sukkot is obviously the plural form of Sukkah. We just went through the, through the festival of Sukkot. Okay? And a sukkah is obviously these, we know them to be these temporary structures. But this comes, this word comes from the Hebrew root word sakak. And sakak means to protect. Yaakov had just been through 21 years of. Um, basically slavery to his uncle. Okay? He had just had this major encounter with God and then had to encounter his brother whom he thought, as soon as this guy sees me, and he had already heard, my brother's coming with 400 guys. And that can only mean one thing, that he's coming to wipe me out. And so he has this very emotionally, mentally, emotionally <clears throat> draining encounter with his brother. And I'm sure at this point in time he's like, I'm tired of this. And I'm just going to go to this place and build me a house and settle down right here. And, and we're just going to stop all of this because I'm tired of it. But if he had stopped, if he had stayed there, that would have been the end of his story. And God would have had to pick it back up with someone else. Because the place of protection, of self-protection, wasn't where God wanted him to end up. God was, God's goal for him was Beit El, the house of God wasn't his own house. It was the house of God. Okay? Obviously, stopping would have been easier. But the house of God was his destiny. And this is a message to us. Because the house of God is our destiny too. And if we stop along the way, in our walk with God, and we say, I'm tired of this, and I'm just going to protect myself, and plant myself right here, and this is where it ends, then guess what? Our story ends with God right there. And what most people don't realize, and don't recognize and see as they're reading through this story even though it was at the moment that Yaakov was wrestling with God that God changed his name to Yisrael. As you read through the story of Yaakov after that it continues to use his name Yaakov to describe him until when? until he arrives at Beit El. Once he arrives at the destiny that God had for him, that's when the change actually starts occurring in the scripture and it starts calling him Yisrael. And because Yaakov finished because Yaakov who was Yisrael finished what God had for him the destiny went on didn't stay in the place of self-protection but went on to the house of God 
we have what we have today. There's no way for us to know, obviously, to be able to go back and recreate a different scenario had Yaakov not done what he was supposed to. We don't know what would have happened, but the story would have been very different. Every one of us, we end up just like Shaul, Shaul Melech, King Shaul, all of us end up thinking that we are nothing. That we're just some nondescript individual on the face of the planet and that we're not important to God. And we end up thinking, how could my choices possibly make any difference in the world? And yet, if you are here on this planet, it is because God specifically chose at a time in the past that you should be born to fulfill a specific and particular role in his plan. And you are not insignificant. You notice that when Shmuel came to Shaul and talked to him after his disobedience, what was it that he said to Shaul? He said, you may think that you're insignificant, but God anointed you to be king of Israel. In other words, you have a major role to play. You may not recognize it, but you do. And because you have screwed up, then you've messed everything up for Israel. Because you looked at your own life and what God had for you as being less important and lower than what it actually was. Every one of us, at all times, as we've talked about so many times in the past, we all are constantly standing, in, a, in spiritual terms, before the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're constantly making a choice as to which of those trees we're going to pick the fruit of and eat. And if we start with God, but then at some point in the middle, in the progress of our walk with the Lord, we choose to turn and start eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we can absolutely stop and ruin the destiny that God had for us, and that be the end. And God doesn't ever want that to be the case in our lives. So as believers, even in our mundane, seemingly mundane daily lives of having to do dishes and clean the house and go to work and all of those kinds of things, it is imperative for us to remain in God as we do go through our lives. You realize that for Avram, Avraham, 25 years went by where nothing significant happened. Okay? God came to him, made some statements to him. 25 years goes by and there's silence from God until God appears to him again. What was Avraham doing in those 25 years? We don't know specifically, but we do know he was being faithful to God and to what God had told him 25 years previous. 
That's the toughest thing. Is to keep on going, to be faithful to God, even when we're even when He seems distant from us. Can you imagine, put yourself in that place? You hear God once, and then you don't hear from Him again for 25 years. Would you keep on? Would you be faithful to what God had said to you? That's why on days like today, where this place it has so many empty seats in it, we still have a service here. Because God spoke. And He said, this is what I want. And we are going to be faithful to what God wants. No matter what the circumstances are. Even though we are, like we talked about earlier, having financial difficulties. That cannot be the deciding factor about what we do. It's going to make things really tough unless something turns around. But this congregation is going to remain. And it is because God has said that it's supposed to. And that's the only reason. That has to be the determination that you have in your life. Personally in your life. Whether you have any kind of quote unquote ministry or not. Just how you personally live your life. You have to have that kind of determination in your life. To remain with God no matter what. That's the only way that we will be able to finish and be able to be ranked with the people that we read about in Hebrews 11. And I guarantee you, I want to give you great hope. I guarantee you that if you are an overcomer until the end, <coughs> by the grace of God, you will be ranked with the people that are listed in Hebrews 11. That's a promise from God. Let's pray. Abba, each one of us have unique stories as to how we started in our relationship with you. But at some point in time, the reason why we're all here is because at some point in time, we had some kind of encounter with you. In which you intervened in our lives and you called us to be different and to be special people who would fulfill a destiny for you. Father, we thank you that through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, that there is keeping power, there is grace that enables us to do what needs to be done. But the whole burden is not on you. We have a part to play in this, in the choices that we make. And Father, you are looking for finishers. You are looking for people who finish strong. Who don't allow their own desires, their own wants, their comfort, whatever, to stand in the way of doing your will. You're looking for people who will obey your word like you say it. Not who think that they can modify what you say. 
and then think, oh, you'll be okay with it. Father, we delight in you. And we give ourselves to you. And our hope and our prayer and what we will work at, Lord, is indeed being overcomers, being finishers. So that we will have a story that will rival anything that we read about in the Scripture. And Father, thank You that Your Son actually told us that not only would we do things as great as He did, but He even went so far as to tell us beyond our comprehension, <coughs> beyond our ability to grasp the implications that we would do greater than He did. Father, we believe. We can't see it with our eyes. At least we haven't seen it so far. But if you said it, we believe it. And we know it's going to happen. So Father, our heart cry and our desire is that just as we started with you, we will finish with you. In Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.